Hello and, and uh, good afternoon. My name is Holly Tucker and I'm director of the Robert Penn Warren Center for the Humanities at Vanderbilt University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Harry C. Howard Jr. Lecture, Reimagining Cities, a conversation with Majora Carter. Harry Howard earned his bachelor degree from Vanderbilt University in 1951. And in 1994, the Harry C. Howard Jr. Lecture was established through the endowment of Mr. and Mrs. Thomas E. Nash Jr. and Mr. and Mrs. George Renfro to honor their friend and attorney by establishing a lecture series in his name at his alma mater. The lecture has become a signature event each year for our center and has featured prominent scholars and artists such as David Blight, James McBride, Danielle Allen, Kiara Hoodies, and most recently, Jakira Diaz. Mr. Howard is among the attendees today, and we are very grateful to him and to his friends for their generosity, which has allowed us to host this year's honored speaker, Majora Carter. Majora is a real estate developer, urban revitalization strategy consultant, MacArthur Fellow, and Peabody winning award broadcaster. She's responsible for the creation and successful implementation of numerous economic developments, technology and green infrastructures, policies and job training and placement systems. Majora is born, raised and continues to live in the South Bronx. She received her undergraduate degree from Wesleyan University and her MFA from New York University. Her ability to shepherd projects through seemingly conflicted socioeconomic currents has garnered her eight honorary PhDs and other awards such as the 100 Most Intriguing Entrepreneurs by Goldman Sachs, Silicon Alley 100 by Business Insider, Liberty Medal for Lifetime Achievement by News Corp, and others other honors from the National Building Museum, the International Interior Design Association, the Center for American Progress, as well as for TED Talk, one of the first um, six that launched that size, site in 2006. And most recently, she was awarded the 2020 Edmund and Bacon Urban Design Award. Additionally, Majora has served on the boards of the US Green Building Council series, the Wilderness Society, and the Andrew Goodman Foundation. Welcome, we're so glad you're here. We are also fortunate to have her joined in conversation today by Dominique Anderson and Paul C. Taylor. Dominique Anderson is an affordable housing and social impact strategy consultant at Dominique Anderson Consulting in Nashville. She specializes in evaluating, creating, and improving a project's social impact on communities of color as well as affordable housing development processes. Her passion for affordable housing and better communities has led her to become the executive director of the Tennessee Affordable Housing Coalition. Paul C. Taylor is W. Elton Jones Professor of Philosophy, Chair of Philosophy, and Professor of American, African American and Diaspora Studies at Vanderbilt University. He received his undergraduate training in Morehouse College and his graduate training at the Kennedy School of Government and at Rutgers University. His research focuses primarily on social and political philosophy, critical race theory, American philosophy, and Africana philosophy. His books include On Obama and Black is Beautiful, a philosophy of Black aesthetics, which received the 2017 monograph prize from the American Society for Aesthetics. He has recently launched the Racial Justice Humanities Lab, which houses several philosophically informed service learning projects related to social justice. Today's talk will be moderated by Leah Lowe. Leah Lowe is Associate Professor of Theater at Vanderbilt and holds, holds a secondary appointment in the American Studies program. She directs plays at our university and in the larger Nashville community, including the highly successful production of how to end poverty in 19 uh, how to end poverty in 90 minutes that's even more wishful thinking with michael road from the sojourn theater and center for performance as civic practice her latest project is sloppy bonnie an original country western musical by v writer and res residence kristen knight and composer barry brinegar the covid conscious outdoor production will premiere in the parking lot of oz arts nashville in late may before we begin, let me extend a heartful thank you to 
Elizabeth Meadows, Terry Tripp, and Mary Gray Lindstrom for all of their hard work in making today's event happen. And I should also mention that there'll be time for a Q&A after the program. So if you have any question, please do submit it in the chat. With this, thank you Majora, Dominique, Paul, and Leah for joining us today. And I'll turn the over, program over to our moderator, Leah Lowe. Thank you, Holly, for those wonderful introductions. Um, Majora Carter, it's wonderful to have you here. I'd love Thank to begin you. by asking you to just give participants an overview of your work. Hmm. We're most interested in sort of thinking about crucial principles. How do you balance principles and values um, in imagining a more just city? Hmm. Well, it kind of helps growing up in one in which principles for its justness were not really considered that well or often or early. Um, so I grew up in the South Bronx in New York City, and uh, we were in, in, in specifically in the 1970s and 80s. And, and it was definitely a poster child for urban blight. Financial disinvestment really created the kind of environmental burdens, the, certainly the socioeconomic conditions that, that most of us lived under. Um, we really also saw, you know, the, the, the extraction, you know, of the fact that many folks actually, you know, like from the great migration, my, my family included, um, you know, came up from down south, actually bought property, which then became worthless. And then over the course of many years, that property sort of became worthless for a while. And then it's sort of like as actually dealing with um, the impact of reurbanization and thus uh, uh, gentrification and displacement. So we're dealing with that kind of crazy little um, cycle that often happens in what we consider Amer what we call American low status communities. And by low status, those are the communities that I um, that will that have poor environmental uh, bird, lots of environmental burdens, um, poor health outcomes, um, high rates of unemployment and poverty, and also, but mostly people looking both inside the community and those from inside the community tend to understand that there is just a layer of inequality applied to them. So if we grow up in a place like that, and you're led to believe that in order to be anything, to do anything for yourself, you have to measure success by how far you get away from them. And I was one of those kids too. Per brain drain is actively perpetuated in American low status communities. It's just a given. You're a smart kid. You need to grow up and get out. We measure success by how far we get away from it. We literally create the the, the dynamic that um, creates um, you know uh, the lack of social cohesion within our communities. We don't create economic diversity. We don't expect um, you know people a promise to stay in our communities, and nor do we give them the reasons to do so. So I moved from actually doing work around the environmental. Um, you know, improvement of our community, which I still really believe in, but moved into like straight on real estate development because I realized that that's where the power was into how do we literally create the kind of communities that people feel they don't have to move out of in order to live in a better one, one that they feel that they have the, the right and the reasons to reinvest socially, um, emotionally, and also economically so that they're not selling, you know, their family's house because they believe there's no value there and that they're really working and, and, and lending their own model for success for future generations and even those just around them to see and really using the assets that is a that that is, are all human beings within their own communities to support its own development. So that's I think that's what I do. I don't know if that answered your question, but that's what I'm that's what I do. So no, that was great. Um what when you think about um serving your community i'm wondering about how how do you do the tricky balance between ideals and practical policies mm -hmm. um wh what are some of the ways that you approach that that kind of thicket i mean it comes from a place of love for my own communities and communities like it whether they are you know native american reservations or whether honestly they're they're poor white you know former um coal mining towns you know that have totally just lost whatever ever they had in there but they're still we suffer from the same issues of being low status and and, and literally being at the receiving end of all the of all the worst kind of social practices that happen right 
And so, but it also comes from looking really practically at what are the tools that frankly, rich white men use in order to make, in order to support the development of things that they actually care about. Like how have they built wealth? How have they used the tools that are out there in particular? And we use real estate development because we know without a shadow of a doubt, like 2020 finally made some folks realize, oh wait, there's a wealth gap. Oh, a lot of it has to do with things like people not having access to capital and property and business development. <sighs> okay, so that access to capital, you know, really recognizing that there were just and still are discriminatory policies that actually literally separated people from their their ability to actually provide for their families to generate wealth and pass it down to generations. I like those tools. I like them a lot. I think we should have access to them. I think we should use them. And um, I think that the folks that have literally kept access away from from people like us doing these things, that there needs to be a come to Jesus moment about it. And then let's figure it all out. And fortunately, I do think that I feel do feel very hopeful that that's starting to happen um, in, in ways that honestly, in 2019, I didn't think was even going to happen. Great. I'd like to um, turn it over to Paul, um, who I know is interested in this um, connection between the the ideal and the practical. Um, Thank you, Professor Lowe. I appreciate your uh, sage guidance in managing this conversation. It is a real honor and a pleasure to be in such uh, profound and thoughtful company. Uh, I'm honored. Uh, I'm particularly thrilled to be a part of this conversation, Ajora, um, because I have the privilege now of, of exploring some possibilities with, with Ms. Anderson um, for some projects here in the Nashville area. And one of the things we wanna do is, or one of the sort of under, uh, underlying commitments for the work we're exploring is that we want um, to make it possible for Vanderbilt to be a good neighbor, right? To be a responsible participant in the life of the Nashville community. And one of the things that means, and I've worked, I'm working with my students on a version of this project. And one of the things we've told them is, one of the things that means is not engaging or engaging in a non-imperialistic way, right? The burden is not to come with Vanderbilt's flag and plant it in the soil and say, we are here to fix things. The burden is to work with our partners in the community to find a way forward that works for all of us. Uh, but that's hard, right? And so that's the root of the question I wanna ask you. It grows out of the question that Leah asked you. Uh, I'm thinking more though, in not less in terms of uh, sort of ideals and practice than in terms of aligning different visions for the future, right? So I'm, I'm curious, uh, to hear you say a little bit about how you approach that that challenge, right, of uh, identifying potential partners, smoothing out the wrinkles between your different visions for the future, managing conflicts that might arise, right? I know you've had some challenges with these things in the past. Anyone who works in this space will have these challenges. And I, I'd love to hear you say a little bit about how you, how you navigate that. Yeah. I mean, I think first off is it really does come down to to love, right? And and really feeling good about where you're coming from. Like I want, whether it's my own community or it's communities that I'm dealing with, like I really want to be able to say at the end of the day, the end of the year, that I've really thought about the kind of projects that we're doing and really, and do not feel ashamed at all about why we've made those decisions. A lot of those decisions also come from the fact that we bothered to talk to people. Um, you know, when we, in my own practice, um, you know, in, in my own neighborhood, and I also, when we work with other communities, this is the kind of thing that we're expecting them to do on some way, shape or form so that they're clear on what the hopes and the dreams and the aspirations, as well as what the needs are within a community. And from there, once you know that, so, and, and our practice just involved, like we did hundreds of surveys, you know, it's like we had been studied as a community, like, you know, from like a very top level, but we've never really asked folks from mm -hmm. what I saw, like straight up, well, 
what do you like? What do you dislike? You know, what are what are your hopes and dreams and aspirations? And it was, you know, looking back on the methodology, it probably wasn't the best survey in the world, but it, we people sat down and answered 60 questions about like, why do they leave the neighborhood for fun? What do they do? What would you like to see here? And that, and from that, we were able to craft, you know, just the kind of, of visions that we that we that people told us what they wanted, right? And through that, and it was really interesting because as developers, like and, you know, and, and frankly, I'm a black female developer with like a long on vision, short on balance sheet, and um, but so I partner with folks all the time, right? Until I'm at a point where it's just like, nah, I could lead a project, which I expect to get to at some point in my life. Um, but the what we would do, we would often just like either rent small storefronts, you know, because we had we built up over years really good relationships with with folks that actually were property owners, and based on what our community, you know, said that they were interested in looking at, you know, we would try to we would we would take advantage of these cheap rents. And then we would try to entice folks to come in to, to build the kind of things that we knew people were leaving the community to experience, right? And uh, so things like cafes and restaurants and stuff like that. And honestly, we could not get anybody to come in to the South Bronx, at least my part of the South Bronx, to open up a coffee shop or a cafe, nothing like that. So that's when we had to do it ourselves. We did develop a joint venture. We got a, um, a, you know, a coffee partner who was amazing. Um, but then we realized that our competition was Dunkin' Donuts, not this like super fancy coffee that people liked, but it was, you know, Dunkin' Donuts was eating our lunch, literally. So we had to like ramp it up in a different way and literally and rebranded to the Boogie Down Grind Cafe. And, um, you know, we're the birthplace of hip hop. And so we basically started doing things like open mics. You know, we rebranded the names of our cap of our cappuccinos and, you know, our grandmaster frappes and things like that. And it really just was that was a, it was about the, our community. And that was really kind of awesome. But what was fascinating about the whole thing is that you know, we built these spaces as ways so that people from our own community would re really like embody what we think is we think is an ethos of our work, which is that you know, community is not just a place; it's an activity. But you have to build the places so that people feel like they can build community. Otherwise, they don't stick around. They just don't. So the talent retention strategy was literally building business, local businesses that made people feel as though their community was worth staying in. Mm. And from there, you could have the conversations about things like, you know, you know, are your parents selling their property and ask them why? And things like, well, nobody wants to live here. This is the hood. And then realizing, but oh, but you're selling your house to a predatory speculator as opposed to looking for a family in the community that might want to stay here because they might be closer to their parents and they've actually done the right thing and gone to school and, and want to, you know, and have gone to college and they can afford to buy this house, but they can't buy it at the rate of a predatory speculator. They just can't, you know, and actually I want to use an example, you know, of what I think, you know, going back to Paul, you wanted your, your earlier question, like, you know, how do you sort of balance this thing in terms of like, you know, being a big institution, like an educational institution, you know, in, in a community. And so you don't like come in with your like ideas of what you should do. Um, one of my favorite examples is actually in a, in Charlotte, North Carolina, Johnson C. Smith University and HBCU partnered with um, some local community groups down there. And it was a really poor part of, of, of Charlotte. And um, so they partnered with also financial institutions who were the ones who supported the development that was led by the local community and the, and the university was supporting them. Mm. And it was, and it's been, I think an overwhelming you know, success along the way, but it was basically the, the financial institution made it possible for those visions to become a reality, but they absolutely came from the, from, from internally from the community. Mm. And it was a really powerful, you know, I think a really great example of like how to make it happen because it's like, it's practical and it's real. And it's not like, you know, I think one of the, you know, the, the frustrations that I have, you know, with the, with the social justice movement in general, you know, is that it's, it's, it's a lot of it's based on, you know, the, 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 the idealization, you know, of like, we've got to dismantle capitalism. And I'm like, go for it. 
you know, if, you know, way smarter people than me have tried and they're still trying, but in the meantime, let's figure out what we can do in the meantime to make people's lives a lot more comfortable than they are right now. We know the concentration of poverty is a terrible thing. Just statistically, it doesn't get better for anybody. That's why people want to leave. So how about we use the tools that we know are available and start demanding those so that we can start developing from the inside out. And that's why the Charlotte example was just like blew me away, just utterly blew me away. And there's, a, there's plenty of other examples out there, you know, like that out there. Not enough as far as I'm concerned, but there's no reason why Vanderbilt couldn't be one of them. Agreed. Hear, hear. Mm -hmm. that a, that's a very powerful example. Uh, it's tremendously encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah, I could say more, but I'm happy to, I want to be a good citizen. So I'm happy to see the floor. Well, I see Ms. Anderson nodding in her box. So <laughs> I want very much to bring her into this conversation. I want to know why you were laughing so much. <laughs> because we are literally spirit animals. And I just, <laughs> I just want to be on record as when it's on video now, it's recording. So when I reach out to her, everyone, I want to be able to report back that she's my new mentor because I <laughs> love everything that you just said. Um, and the, the thing about capitalism makes me laugh because um, in addition to the millions of things that I currently do, um, one of my clients is the Center for Transforming Communities in Memphis, and I'm working with them as a just growth champion mm. um, and, and launching the Community Land Trust and some other things. But the whole point of that is that I told my husband, who's a native Memphian, and I'm a native Nashvilleian by way of Puerto Rico, but I mm. grew up here. My mother's a native Nashvilleian. So um looking at that conversation and just thinking about the vast difference from the conversations i have in memphis to what i have in nashville mm -hmm. um and especially it, even within communities of color and people wanting to do the good work is always about capitalism um and so i'm what i like to call a money-making hippie and i think <laughs> that you get that right so I, <laughs> I one of the things that and one of the conversations i have all the time is well, how do we get rid of capitalism? You shouldn't, right? Like you should, but you can't. So here's in, in the space. Mm -hmm. And so the question really is, how do money-making hippies like you and myself, how do we you know, <laughs> do the good work and make money, right? Like how do you do well by doing good? Mm -hmm. um, and how do, you, how do you internally juggle that? Not feeling bad about making money, not feeling bad about you know, like Jay-Z said, you can't help the poor if you're one of them, right? Preach so how it. Do you, how do you juggle that? I don't feel bad at all. And, you know, and honestly, I wish that I was as wealthy as people like to think I am when I when, when I talk about money as much as I do. Because I'm just like, don't, don't, you know what, seriously, like, I'm, I am learning as I go and I realize I made so many mistakes by not understanding the way money actually flowed by not understanding some of the same principles that the rich white guys like they tell their kids they didn't tell us they didn't tell us so i don't have any children i could pass anything down to i got i got a gajillion nieces and nephews though so they're all expecting something at some point but um and you know what they can have it but my but 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 i really do feel is like we've got to raise the bar for an understanding of capital flows and in particular how it moves through real estate and especially now i mean with when it's so ripe where if we under i think folks get like why we've lost so much it's like people understand tulsa and greenwood and killer mike's talking about it um and there's just this this I think there's the the hope and the possibility now and what we've got to get what we've got to get out of our way is this idea that we need to feel bad about making money. I mean, who does that serve? Thousand percent agree. Yeah. Who does that serve? And you know, and and having like issues with 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 the idea that somehow if you do that, you know, you're not really a part, you know, of the club and it's just like Mm, you know, when we got a little $10,000 grant from Beyonce when she was doing the Bay Good thing for, for Black-owned small businesses, 
I looked around, you know, at the range and the depth of which she literally supported many of us to stay afloat. And I thought, that's amazing. There she did. She just paid it forward. Just like that. You know, no skin off her back, I'm sure. Thank God. Uh, because it's a beautiful back and she's just amazing. Um, but and not, so none of most of us are never going to get to that level. Right. But we can be thinking about how do we take what we have within our own community, hold on to it and use it as a, as a support system for all of us. You know, one of them is just really recognizing that money isn't bad, how we use it is, but how are we you, literally using our opportun the opportunities that are there to be like, okay. And I love the idea of community land trusts on a certain level, but I've been utterly underwhelmed by the way I hear most people talk about them. And it's not because they're not actually being used, I think, to full effect um, in terms of actually how do you help people literally create the, the type of, of foundation so that they're building equity. Most of them are talking about, oh, we need to build a nice community center that's still based, that's still based on, on, on philanthropic support as opposed to how do we use the, 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 the opportunity so that we can create businesses around it or home ownership opportunities. Right. And those conversations, I've certainly haven't heard them, you know, in most places I go, we don't hear them. Whereas there's like amazing, you know, uh, programs like um, it's called EB Prec, uh, that uh, East Bay Permanent Real Estate Collective. They are actually buying a property, building businesses, building um, home ownership opportunities and creating some levels of permanent affordability you know, for, for, for certain folks that, 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 um, that really need it. And then others sort of buy into the vision. So it's a, it's a collective, but it's a really power, but they're using straight up bank financing. You know, they are getting some really interesting stuff from um, uh, like the kind of funds, you know, that are supportive of, you know, people of color and women owned stuff and on, and amen, God bless them. That's amazing. But their core is really about local economic development and wealth, the generational wealth creation. Right. Otherwise, yeah. it's just we're always just waiting for somebody to come and be nice to us. And, you know, that hasn't worked out that well. Absolutely. I, I won't hijack this, Leah, because I literally could have a 12 hour conversation about this. And I'm sure we will at some point. We will. I um, know. I'm looking forward to it. Community land trust and community investment trust, I think, is, is the conversation. Um, just another question is what does economic investment look like that serves the community? We talked, you just talked a little bit about it, but like if it serves the community, what does that look like? And then how do we encourage that in, in yeah. putting together good community land trust and community investment trust and all of that? Yeah. And you know what? And it's just, that's, that's, there, there's so many tools right now. One of my new favorites is, um, you know, is the fact that now uh, unaccredited investors can invest in real estate development projects and other kind of business development projects. You know, thanks to the new um, Security and Exchange Commission rules, like you no longer have to have, I don't even know what the number was, but it was something like a million dollars in assets and make over $200,000 a year. But, you know, if you're going to invest in some of these projects, but now you can do them literally, um, you know, for, your, for some places where the floor is like you can invest $100 and you get say, either a revenue share, in some cases equity, and but you get the same rate of return that uh, someone who's investing $5 million because now they can do those side by side kind of investments. And I think those are really powerful tools, you know, that allow folks to literally see their money work. Or not, because yes, you could lose everything, but it's it's a hundred dollars, so it's like it's like you know we spend more than that on sneakers sometimes. Um, I think what it, what's the what uh, what's his name married to the Kim the Kim woman Kim Kardashian. Uh, what what his Kanye sneakers West? just sold? Yeah, Kanye. His sneakers, worn sneakers just sold for God knows how much money. So okay, not everybody's going to do that, but I know they sell for a lot. Um, I'm a, I get mine from Costco, so I don't really know what people, what people do, but anywho, um, but I, but I do think that those tools, like literally people being able to see that their money can spend the same way anybody else's does is a powerful thing. Like I, cause we've got another property, um, over here. It's an old rail station that we acquired, um, that we're going to transform into a, um, it's about 4,500 square feet and it's about 3,500 
a feed if it's going to be you know just a, a an event hall that we will rent out for all sorts of events music etc and the, the thousand square foot is a separate commercial space that we're going to transform um as soon as we possibly can into a recreational weed lounge you know now that it's it's legal in the states it, excuse me in new york state and it's it's really awesome because the the our legislation made a very significant point of making sure that the communities that were most affected by that quote unquote war on drugs are the ones that should absolutely be the ones who profit most from this legislation. And so you bet your bippy that, you know, our commercial weed lounge over here, as much as we possibly can, and I, I, I honestly don't know how to do this, but we'll figure it out. You know, we want to make sure that people in our own daggone community own a piece of that straight up you know like my little old lady who lives across the street who will turn 98 this you know she needs to have a little piece of that she's not going to go in there i don't care but the point is like she's got grandkids let them have some and well when when they're old enough or whatever but you know what i mean um but it's super exciting and and i feel like now is the time for us to sort of like st step away from this like you know you're not a legit you know person if, unless you're like not unless you want to dismantle capitalism, you know, or, you know, you're not really, you know, woke if you don't, if you actually talk about money in a way that's not just like, let's only take care of super poor people because that's basically what's, what is the only thing that we're ever going to be. No, like we need to create economic, you know, the kind of like vision for our own communities that, you know, is, is diverse. And that shows that, you know, even I think about some of the unintended, you know, unintended consequences of integration, you know, we were racially segregated, but our communities were economically diverse. And I think it was easier in those cases to like, for people to see the possibility of, of a future that was inclusive of them, that wasn't just about being tortured and poverty stricken. And then having that as your sole expectation, but our communities are so segregated economically, not just racially, but economically. And I think that has an impact on how we see ourselves in the future. And, and sometimes I think some of the, the heat that even, you know, the, my, the colleague, um, you know, in, in, uh, in Charlotte, when they did that project, you know, even though the development was being done by the local community, and this was even before we started. So it was like, I should have taken their example, like even more seriously than I did. Um, there were, there were people in the community who were just like, saw any development and could not possibly imagine that there were other people from that community doing that development and started throwing the, the gentrification word at them. And it was just like, wait, you see, mm -hmm. no, like, this is like, this is like Jojo from down the street you know, who went to some training and figured out how to do this. These are your neighbors. And, you know, the, the, the head of Johnson C. Smith University is like, you know, March with King when he was a little kid. And he was just like, uh, -uh. and he was like total reverend as well. He was like, no, we ain't gonna go there people. And, um, and he basically told them, it's like, no, this isn't gentrification. If anything, it's self gentrification, because this is development that's happening by us and for us. And besides which we like nice things too. Let's not pretend that we don't. And, um, I don't use that phrase anymore because it's just like it's just too triggering for people. But um, but I I think we we've, we've gotta like embrace the fact that we've been great creators and innovators of awesome things and have been. And how do we sort of take that and and spread it forward as we think about how do we restore our communities as well? You know, again from the inside out. Professor Taylor, you're nodding now, so can join in. I would love to jump back in. Uh, yeah. I could listen to the two of you talk about the details of uh, urban revitalization all day. It's tremendously edifying and exciting. Uh, but I find myself thinking of the stakes of this work. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, we do this work. We try to alter the material conditions under which people live their lives so that they can live richer and fuller lives. It's not about the material conditions, mm -hmm. that's the precondition for other things, right? Mm -hmm. right. People wanna prosper, they wanna have meaning, they wanna 
have access to the spaces that matter to them. They want to be able to aspire to things, right? So there's a rich spiritual dimension that's attached to this. Mm -hmm. And yes. I find myself thinking, Majora, about the challenges, the existential challenges of doing this work, right? Even for someone as successful as you in the spaces where you've been most successful, I imagine that work is routinely fraught with uh, defeat and setbacks. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder what it, what it has taken for you uh, to assemble the resources to manage those setbacks, right? Mm -hmm. I think of uh, earlier in your career, you, you wrote and spoke eloquently about uh, your disappointments around climate justice and greening the economy and so forth. And so I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you manage yourself emotionally, mm -hmm. spiritually in the face of these dire challenges, these, these towering burdens and obstacles. Right? Mm. What does it mean for you as an agent of change to manage yourself through the disappointments and the inevitable setbacks? I, I have to constantly, you know, remind myself that I am fearfully and wonderfully made and that you know, my father, mother loves me, built me exactly the way I was supposed to be built. And, you know, and as a woman of faith, like that is literally what I go back on because otherwise it becomes, it, I will take it personally. And I remember like early on in my career, I absolutely did. And it was just like, what is going on here? And, um, you know, but again, you know, even before, like I found faith, it was more about like, wait a second, if, if I go down, you know, and, and, you know, and the thing, the beautiful thing about doing this work, and I think especially for so many folks, like they're just happy somebody's doing it. And, and literally, like I, I heard people say, it's like, I am so glad you're doing this because, and basically the, the honest ones will just be because I know I can't. And, and so that is a driver. It absolutely is. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Like when people, when you know that the, the fruits of your labor, which I do love, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, it's not like I don't love what I do. It, 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 ins it inspires me and emboldens me. And it makes me like so happy that I get to build stuff that people enjoy actually mostly more than I do, but um, that, that's okay. That's not the point. The point is, it's like, you know, I, I know why I was placed on this earth. And so, but so much of it really is, you know, knowing whose child I am, you know, and also um, knowing that there's, I need to take the time that I need. Like I spend time in prayer, meditation, I work out like a lot. And that really does just make it so that, okay, this is how I fortify me so that I can go out and do the other crazy stuff. And sometimes, you know, when I feel like nobody cares and not even nobody cares, people actively <laughs> go out of their way to remind me that I am not appreciated. Um, and it's just like, okay, because then the good stuff happens and then I forget like all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dominique, would you like to ask another question before we turn it over to um, questions from our audience? I have like 42 questions, Leah, but I'll definitely keep that <laughs> okay, one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when there was a question that sparked this about healthcare, about health and, and development, and I often say that all roads lead back to real estate, right? So mm -hmm. everything really is at the core of real estate. How do you, in the work that you do, how do you make that spider web, that ecosystem in your projects? You mean the, the web of like the, the between the built and the natural environment and how real estate development kind of informs them all? Or right. I just want to make or sure I'm understanding the question. That web between, let's say that if, if real estate is the core of a community mm -hmm. and it, everything that comes out from it, from education to healthcare, all of that, how do you, do you touch those, all those systems inside of the projects that you do to have a partner from healthcare? Do you have a partner in education? Do you have a partner in other community events? That's a really, that's an awesome question because not 
um, informally, yes. And, and we, and it, it almost happens. And this is what's so real. What's, what's kind of cool is that it develops like in these really weird organic ways. Like for example, um, last year, actually before the pandemic, we act our coffee shop, we, you know, it's like this, 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 um, you know, nexus for, for artists, you know, to, they, they, we've got a big wall. So they, they, they do art showings and stuff like that. And so we actually got a little pot of money from our, from an arts organization, you know, from the Bronx council and the arts to support artists, like emerging artists to use our space, you know, to, to host their work. And then the pandemic hit. And then, you know, so it was like, we can't have people inside. We just can't. So what are we going to do? So what did we do? We put the artwork outside. And so we would host these, these, these like mini art and performing arts events like every single week. And we had linoleum, a linoleum dance floor that we'd put out um, and it would be a dance party. You know, when people would, would would look at art and it would just be like this, this open air, wonderful way for people to connect. And I swear, like even there were a couple of times when we probably went later than we should have. But even the people in the building above would come down and be like, OK, you went a little late last night. However, um, it was it was so nice to hear like sounds of laughter and joy on the street that we just we were like, nobody call the cops. It was amazing. And so now we're building these partners because because we saw like the kind of mental health and physical health issues that were being addressed and you know and actually crime on our corner didn't happen like as, as long as we've been you know on that coffee shop and we were just like wait a second like this is actually a public health benefit here so we're actually now building those relationship with the with the public health sector in the public and private sector sector because like they're they're just like what are you doing like somebody saw pictures of something that we were posting on instagram and they were just like this is the kind of stuff that we that we want to see more people do and then it gives us an opportunity to talk to them about you know mental well-being and physical blah 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 and we could do testing and i'm just like good this is what real estate can be used for we weren't trying to go out of our way to make that happen. We weren't at all. But now, you know, we're hoping that some of them will be supportive of this future work, which also supports artists, which supports us as a small business because more people come to the cafe to hang out and, you know, see the art and listen to the performances and, you know, just feel better about just like their lives because something cool is actually happening in their own community. And so those, and, and you know, and even with the, the local, and I can't tell you how many um, young people I've mentored just by act of literally being out there. And once they realize that um, it, for some reason, it's the funniest thing, but it, it, it pains me. But at the same time, you know, it just shows us like how much further we need to go. You know, they'll, they'll appreciate me, my work. And then they'll ask me, so where do you live? Mm. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, well, if you cross the street, it could walk straight through that building, you'd be in my backyard. And they're like, wait, you live in this neighborhood, but you're, you're like successful. Mm. And all, that's all relative, obviously, but you know, but in their eyes I am. And, but to them, successful people don't stay in neighborhoods like this. Mm -hmm. And why is that normal? We've normalized that as opposed to recognizing like we're daughters and sons of this community and like our first fruits, why is it that, that our best fruit doesn't like give forth and support the development of more in our own community. Like I want to plant flowers here and I want other folks to do that too. I want them to come home. Like I think of homecomings, you know, um, so that we, so that we can inspire, you know, folks to think about how do we create value in our own community by supporting the value that's already here. So that that in turn actually is that reinvestment comes back to support us. And yeah, it's just, it's an exciting, exciting kind of place to be in. And I know it's really hard for a lot of folks to kind of take in, um, especially since, you know, white supremacy doesn't just impact, you know, doesn't just come from, I mean, only, not only white people are affected by white supremacy, but we've taken in the, this idea that we are actually less than on some level and we act that out. I think especially in the space, you know, that has to do with with uh, the monetary value within our own community. Um, white supremacy is a very 
powerful tool. Yeah. This makes my spirit smile. I just want to let you know that. Everyone, <laughs> everyone all together. That's so beautiful. The chat is starting to explode with questions. So um, I, I have one that sort of relates to your last um, point here. Um, it seems that much of the complexity around urban affordability and access to wealth building opportunities is zoning, <sighs> combating sprawl, redevelopment, and gentrification. How can we reimagine traditional zoning policies to maximize live, work, play, allow families and business owners to graduate up within a neighborhood mm -hmm. over generations and build real wealth rather than the limitations of typical affordable housing policies? Mm. Mm. Okay, yes. Um, I mean, zoning is like such a monster and it's super annoying and it's probably way more complicated than it needs to be. And it's often used as a crutch, you know, against increasing density that allows more things. Because right now we've got, you know, it's a law of supply and demand. And gentrification is a byproduct of reurbanization that exists within the, within the context of zoning policies that don't allow more growth. That, so so basically you've got speculators who you know know how to game the real estate system you know who are often you know buying properties for way less than they're worth you know in in the, these reurbanized you know inner core communities that are being gentrified right and then they're coming in you know to making sure that people don't understand the value of their own homes they buy property who are they building for they're not building for the folks that are here um um and so then but no new building is is often happening as well so that's is that is one of the problems that where zoning is just like like how is this not even considered real but it's not but the other thing that i think is super important is that even within the context of policy the fact that owner occupied you know low income homeowners you know in communities they are often a tremendous source of affordable housing because they're not Often they will often like rent to their families, you know, or to people that they know, and and the price that they rent at is generally more affordable than a lot of than other places that would would expect to, they you'd get right. So they're not being supported to stay. There's almost never any opportunities. I've I found I and if, and if someone knows them, please let me know. Um, I'm trying to see if there's the same kind of you know. If you look commit a crime, you'll get a court appointed attorney. If you want to sell a property, you can just, you can do it in a week. No, it doesn't, when it goes, when that deed is, is goes from one, one place to another, nobody checks to see if the family that sold it knew exactly what they were getting into. Like we saw in 2008, the kind of crazy, stupid um, mortgages and nobody, people should have gone to jail for what they did to folks and took advantage of people who literally, most of them were not aware of what they were getting into. And, it should have been criminal, but it wasn't. And I still think it's criminal. The fact that the sometimes six figure deals just go across a table from a family that was able to buy a home, you know, in, in a low status community back when nobody wanted it. And then reurbanization happens and a speculator can buy it. No questions asked because people don't realize that, you know, they're, they don't know how to watch real estate trends because again, we don't have the uncles in the business who are passing that knowledge down. I want an uncle in the business. We could make, we, you know, some, some folks could make that happen. Um, so why are we not? Why is philanthropy not building funds so that what they could, they're buying those homes and say and holding on to them so that people in the family could buy them? I, you know, there's all sorts of things that could happen at a very local level if folks wanted to do it and you know policies could be could, could that could be created around that as well to to ensure at least an opportunity for folks to be able to move move into the realm of wealth creation possibilities or even just retention just keep hold on have the people who do own property hold on to it let's make sure that happens Yeah, zoning. Oof. Um, 
here's an interesting question that connects to um, what you said earlier, which I loved about community, not just being a place, but also being an activity. Um, the audience member writes, um, my name is Bharati. I'm the founder of an Indian environmental mm. and social justice nonprofit, Chintan. Mm. Thank you for your words. My question is about key elements. Um, do we build cities or neighbor as we build cities or neighborhoods, which are also communities of empathy and inclusion? Mm -hmm. I'm coming from the space of our ongoing tragic yeah. pandemic where thousands are dying every day. We don't have oxygen. We are seeing mm -hmm. lots of people of all kinds putting out resources, but even as neighbors are looking for oxygen for neighbors and feeding the elderly, we see that the way that newer cities are planned, people live in a way that breaks these linkages. Mm. linkages. Have you seen this and how do you address yes. this? I mean, well, first of all, my heart just goes out to, 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 to India in, in general. And, you know, I'm just, just pray for, for this, for safety. And, and, and it just does not surprise me that folks are out there you know, trying as hard as they can, you know, but what you described in the first part of this, of, of, of this, uh, of your comment really is people trying to take care of each other, right? Like they know that they've got a neighbor who needs some help and, you know, at, you know, at jeopardy to themselves, like they're going to try to get them some help, right? And you're absolutely right. I think the way that so many um, places are being built right now, and even the way some, in particular, low status communities um, operate those the, the idea those social those bonds where community is an activity, um, and a, a unbelievably horrid example, but it's it's very illustrative. Um, back in there was a huge heat wave in in Chicago a number of years ago, and there was this this one horrible story. Both very poor neighborhoods, demographically pretty much the same racial economic, they were just poor, very poor communities. But one community had little places where people actually saw each other. So there was like a public market, you know, nothing crazy, but just like people would get together and like, like, like a flea market and sell stuff. In another neighborhood, there was nothing like that. And that neighborhood had one of the highest death rates, because people didn't even know who their neighbors were. So they died, especially the elderly, alone in their homes because nobody even know to look for them. Whereas in the other place, people knew it's like, oh, we need to go check out, you know, Mr. Roberts over here or whatever, because we haven't seen him around. So let's just make sure he's good. And that's how they would get people out of their like hot apartments, you know, and into cooling centers and they live a lot more. And so your point is incredibly well taken because how we design communities so that you can build those type of community, um, you know, linkages, 